Okay, we are picking up with Scarborough Fair on 731. <clears throat> I'm going to try and get us through um, The World is Too Much With Us on 780, which is on the syllabus for one of the last things for April 12th. <clears throat> this is a ballad. Um, you got a little introduction to ballads. Medieval English ballads, or ballads in the English tradition, go back to the Middle Ages. It's not quite sure when they began, probably no earlier than around 1200 or so, because prior to that, you have a different literary tradition in England called the Old English Literary Tradition. Um, most of them survive from manuscripts from the late medieval period, the late 15th century, the very early 16th century. It's a very um, important manuscript. I'm pretty sure it's in the, what's called the Harley Collection at the British Library. Um, that contains, this one manuscript contains, pretty sure it's over 100 or so ballads. The ballads, um, one of the characteristics, <coughs> excuse me, of ballads, is they're oral in nature. That is, they were composed orally rather than written. They weren't, uh, they don't belong to a literate tradition, so to speak. Once they get copied into a manuscript, yeah, then people begin playing around with them. But as an example of what I've talked about, we have this poem, Scarborough Fair, an anonymous ballad, date unknown. We don't know when it was first sung. We don't know when it was first written down. We have a manuscript again, around 1500 that it exists in. On your syllabus, you have next to this a link to a song version of Scarborough Fair that was recorded in the late 60s by Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel. The lyrics are by, if I remember correctly, Paul Simon. They're different than this. You have some of the same lines, are you going to Scarborough Fair, Parsley Sage, Rosemary, and Time. But the rest of the lyrics for each of the stanzas differs a little bit from what we have in this poem. And that is totally fine. In the ballad tradition, each balladeer, each person who would you know, go around from town to town visiting, plying his wares, so to speak, singing his songs, would often recite or sing a slightly different song each time he or she sang it. Usually he, okay? Most of the balladeers were men. So, look at what the poet is doing here. This is often listened to, or especially Simon and Garfunkel's version, is taken to be, you know, it's a great love poem. This is not a great love poem. This is a great broken love poem. This is a great unfaithful love poem. Where are you going to Scarborough Fair? Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Remember me to a bonnie lass there, for once she was a true lover of mine. Notice line two is repeated throughout every stanza. Okay? So, a speaker meets somebody else. Where are you headed? You're going to Scarborough Fair. Scarborough is a, is a town in the north east Midlands, if I remember correctly, of England near the coast. And it's a major market town, meaning one day a month, the whole town center, town square, we're not talking large. Murfreesboro would be a lot larger than this, okay? Woodbury would probably be larger than this. Everybody would come in from the surrounding countryside to sell their produce, to sell their wares, and to buy, and maybe take in a play, one of the medieval morality plays or miracle plays, etc. okay? <coughs> So, where are you going to Scarborough Fair, Parsley Sage, Rosemary Time? Remember me to a bonnie lass there, for once she was a true lover of mine. Remember me to her means remind her of me. Like, you know, uh, if you meet Georgia, tell her Fred says hello, <laughs> as it were. But then we get the last line of the stanza. For once she was a true lover of mine. Once was. It's emphasizing the past nature, the past tense nature of this. 
once she was a true lover of mine, is telling us at least two things. One, we're no longer lovers. Two, she didn't remain a true lover. That is, we're no longer lovers because she wasn't true. Okay? It also implies that when they were lovers, he discovered she wasn't true then. It's not like they fell out of love and then he comes to discover a month later she's shacking up with somebody else on the side. So that opening stanza, the conclusion of it, you know, it's tinged negatively. Tell her, so if you meet her, tell her to make me a cambric shirt. Without, I'm not going to read the second line anymore. Without any needle or thread worked in it. And she shall be a true lover of mine. Okay, so how do you make a shirt without needle and thread? It's impossible. So what is also impossible? that she shall be a true lover of mine. Is he giving her an impossible task because he knows there is no way she can be a true lover and therefore will show it by her not being able to achieve this impossible task? I think it's yes to both. Tell her another thing. Tell her to wash that shirt that is impossible to make in yonder well where water ne'er sprung, nor a drop of rain fell. So what good is a well if you don't dig down deep enough to hit the aquifer and water to spring up, or it doesn't hold water when it rains? And she shall be a true lover of mine. That is, second impossible task. Tell her to plow me an acre of land between the sea and the salt sea strand, and she shall be a true lover of mine. Well, where does the sea and the strand, what we would call the shore, end? Where does the sea end and the shore begins? Where the sea is. There is no acre of land between those, obviously. So, another impossibility. Tell her to plow it, that acre of non-existing land. Tell her to plow it with one ram's horn and sow it all over with one peppercorn. Now, sowing... Excuse me, plowing an acre of land with a single ram's horn is not, literally speaking, impossible. Would it take a hell of a long time? Yes, it would. But to sow that entire acre with one pepper seed, that's impossible. Last line. Notice the last line, beginning with stanza two, is the same all throughout. Tell her to reap it, that is, the grown pepper, which is not going to grow, obviously, because you can't do it. Tell her to reap it with a sickle of leather and tie it all up with a tomtit's feather, and she shall be a true lover of mine. But how do you make a sickle out of leather? Like, if I were to take this belt off, it's just going to hang there limp. Not going to work. What's a tomtit? It's a bird about the size of my thumb. Okay? So how small would a feather be on this bird? Tell her to gather it all in a sack and carry it home on a butterfly's back. That is emphasizing the impossibility. What can a butterfly carry? And then she shall be a true lover of mine. Notice, and she shall be a true lover of mine. Stanzas two, three, four, five, six. Wait, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. And then seven. And then, in other words, when she does all of these impossible tasks, then she'll be a true lover. What's he really saying? It's impossible. She is incapable of loving truly. Truly there probably means exclusively one person. Who might be the hearer? We don't have no idea, so it's an open-ended question. The hearer might be someone she knows. The hearer might, could be her current lover. This could be some guy with sour grapes just wanting to do what? With this bonnie lass of Scarborough. 
totally ruin her reputation, okay? We, again, we don't know her side of the story, it's just this one. So, go from there to, and when you have time, um, I don't know that the link works in the PDF version, it should. Click on the link, if you've never heard it, to Simon and Garfunkel's Scarborough Affair. I used to play it in class until YouTube started hitting me with copyright violations, even though it shouldn't, because this is called fair use. It's a teaching environment. Anyway, um, and it's a pain to fight Google. Um, go from there to The Lamb on 768 by William Blake. Okay, so again, with Scarborough Fair, we know nothing about the author. Right? Blake we do. Blake we know quite a bit. Blake, late 18th, early 19th centuries, 1757 to 1827. Um, Blake was kind of a jack of all trades. He was a poet. He was an essayist. He was a painter. He was an engraver. He actually invented, if I remember correctly, some types of um, representative physical art um, involving acid etching, if I remember correctly. The first poem we're going to read by him, The Lamb, is from his book, Songs of Innocence, collection of poems. They all fit under this kind of rubric. The next poem we're going to read, The Tiger, from 1794, Songs of Innocence, 1789, Songs of Experience, 1794, that is, five years later, are different kinds of songs. Okay, we'll talk about the difference that he means by innocence and experience later. One other comment about Blake. I said he is an essayist. He is also a literary critic. Well, he had read John Milton's Paradise Lost. I think I mentioned before. Big, long, massive poem about this long. Milton wrote it to, as he says, to justify the ways of God to man. In other words, if God is just, if God is all-powerful, if God is all-knowing, why is the world so screwed up? Okay? Milton tries to answer that question. Milton portrays Satan in that poem as just this magnificent general. I mean, this is the kind of guy you want leading you into battle. This is not the one who leads from behind. This is the one who rouses his troops. He gives Satan all the greatest speeches. So that Blake said Milton was secretly of the party of Satan, meaning deep down inside, he really liked Satan. He just, you know, Satan has this rebellious attitude and has this strength of character, right? Well, that idea, partly, is going to come up. In, in his criticism of Milton, he talked about this one particular scene where Satan has been kicked out of Satan and all his followers, thrown out of heaven, and they're down on the burning lake of fire. And they're literally down there. It's like the scene in Young Frankenstein when they get stuck between the bookcase and the wall and they're like, push, push, push. He's literally down there laying flat on this lake of fire and he's talking to Beelzebub over here. And he's like, you know, if I could only get up. If I could get up, I would rouse the troops and we'd assault heaven, blah, blah, blah. And then it's almost literally where the poem goes, meanwhile, back in heaven on the throne of the highest, and we have God looking down at Satan, hearing Satan say this stuff, and God just smiles. It's it. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't move a finger, nothing. He just smiles, and Satan gets up off the lake. Why? God smiles because he's allowing Satan to get up. He's allowing Satan to do what he wants to do because, as Milton argues in the rest of the poem, God has everything in control. He knows how it's all going to play out. That's why he smiles. He smiles in derision, we're told. There's going to be a smiling in the second poem that we'll talk about. So, the lamb. Listen to these two poems. Listen to the meter, the melody of them. Sorry, not melody, the meter. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? 
Sounds kind of sing-song, right? It's like a child's nursery rhyme. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name. For he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child, thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Now, first of all, is it speaking about a literal out in the field <laughs> lamb? Not necessarily. That is there. Okay. But it's not only that. The lamb is a symbol. It's standing for both itself and connecting to something else. So the question becomes, who made you? Do you know who made you? Who gave you life? Who bid thee feed? Who told you to feed on the grass and stuff? Who gave you clothing? Who gave thee a tender voice? Right? Because lambs don't do what? They don't snarl. They don't growl. Making all the males rejoice. Now, that all sounds like a lamb out in the fields. I'll tell thee. He, notice, is called by thy name. So who, a he, is called a lamb? Christ. John the Baptist says, when Jesus comes to him to be baptized, <coughs> he's saying to a couple of his followers, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Okay? He's called by your name. He calls himself a lamb. Throughout the, new, throughout the book of Revelation, when Christ is referred to, he's referred to as the Lamb of God. He is meek. He is mild, like a lamb. Do lambs not fight back if they're attacked? Yes, they do, but it's pretty ineffectual, okay? He is meek, he is mild, he became a little child. Christmas, nativity. I a child, thou a lamb. Who's the I? Who's the speaker? When, when did this suddenly, I a child, thou a lamb? Is the speaker Christ? I'm a child, you're a lamb, because before it was he, he, we went from third person to first person. I a child, thou a lamb, we together are called by his name. That implies that the speaker is a child. Don't know what age, kind of unimportant. Little lamb, God bless thee, little lamb, God bless thee. And so the speaker issues a blessing on the lamb. Now, in one sense, a child is not qualified to offer a blessing. In order to offer a blessing, you must have the authority, the power, whatever, to do that. So that's a song of innocence. How is a child innocent? Compare a five-year-old with a 25-year-old. But hopefully... Has a five-year-old not experienced that a 25-year-old has? Life. All the crap. Hamlet slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. All that stuff. How should a five-year-old look at the world around him or her? With eyes of wonder. Okay? They should look at people as being good, as being helpful, and all that kind of stuff. But by 25, what have you come to learn? Not everyone is good. Not everyone is helpful. There are monsters in the world, and that's you know the purpose of fairy tales. Okay? That's innocence. Experience teaches you what? You got to be careful. You got to go into things with your wise eyes open, eyes wide open. You know, when my brother-in-law would would come out for whatever, or we'd go out there for. A, visit my brother-in-law, ex-cop, he would always, you know, if we went to a restaurant, he'd find a place, if this is the door opened into the restaurant, he'd be sitting against that back wall, why? So that he could see whoever is coming in. He would, had been undercover and all that stuff. Just, you know, situational awareness, all right? The tiger. Listen to the sound of this as opposed to the lamb. The little lamb has that sing-song nursery rhyme effect. 
Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what, they rhyme, or supposed to rhyme. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? In what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Now let's stop there, we'll get to the final stanza. is just a reprisal of the first stanza. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. Notice, in the forest of the night. How does a tiger, quote unquote, burn bright in the forest of the night? It's not like a jaguar. It's not black. Tiger is orange and black. The black would filter into the shadows of the night, but the bright orange fur, that's going to be seen. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Why does the hand or eye that creates the symmetry, the form, the structure of the dragon, of the tiger, why does it need to be immortal? What's the difference between a tiger and a lamb? If you have two, you're not in the zoo. There's a lamb over here and there's a tiger over here. Do you go up to the tiger the same way you do the lamb? No, because to the tiger, you're what? Possibly. If it's hungry, you're food. No matter how hungry a lamb is, you're not food for it. Okay? It's an immortal hand or eye because it must be undying. So it can't be killed by the fearful symmetry of the tiger. Why, why describe the tiger with this fearful symmetry? How many of you have watched a cat hunt? I've got a 16 pound orange cat, fat. But when it's out hunting birds or mice, which it does sometimes, you watch that thing move and fearful symmetry is a perfect description. If you watch, get on YouTube and watch a video of a lion or a tiger hunting and to watch the movements, it's perfectly symmetrical. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? That is, where, what was the source of the fire in the tiger's eye? What's meant by that? This burning in the tiger's eye. It's not literal, obviously. You know, you got the, the song by Survivor from the 1980s from the Rocky film, Eye of the Tiger. What is that? What's it referring to? It's the single-minded obsession. You've got to have all your attention on that one thing. Does Hamlet have the eye of the tiger? Mm, kind of. It takes a lot for him to really get to it, though. All right? But why in distant deeps or skies must the fire be gotten from? The poet is alluding in this stanza to a couple of old Greek myths. Prometheus and the seizing of fire from the gods. Okay. In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? According to the myth of Prometheus, the gods hid fire from humanity on Mount Olympus. And Prometheus ascended it and stole fire from the gods. That's how we acquired fire. And for that, they punish him forever. I think he's the one who's chained to a rock and he has his liver eaten out for all eternity. On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? Now that's possibly, I'm not sure that it is, possibly an allusion to another Greek myth, Icarus and Daedalus. Okay? Make the wings fly up, get too close to the sun. The fire melts Icarus's wings and you know, he dies. In what shoulder and what heart could twist the sinews of thy heart? 
Okay, what art is understandable? Art means artistic ability, you know, sculpturing skill to frame the sinews of their heart. But what about shoulder? What shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? Shoulder is talking about strength. Okay. Sometimes when you do something that requires a lot of strength, you'll, you'll hear something like, you know, put your shoulder into it. That means use the full strength of your upper body. All right? Get leverage. What's he implying? The heart of this thing, it's got to be controlled. Like it's ready to almost attack or burst out. So it's got to be wrung into shape. And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand, that is, the hand making the beat, and what dread feet, Feet is referring to the stressed, unstressed syllable. Systolic, diastolic, or the other way around. What the hammer, what the chain? That's the beat. The chain, the chain that is being linked, that is being forged on an anvil. What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? Notice, this isn't an anvil. The brain is being formed in a furnace. The heart was formed, you know, via the chain, the anvil, all that kind of stuff. The brain's different. The brain's what animates the heart. The fire in a furnace is different than a fire on a bed of coals. The one in the furnace is going to be much hotter. All right? What the anvil, what dead grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? What dread grasp, but do what? Clasp the terrors of the brain. Why? Because the brain is full of all kinds of things. It's, it's hard to understand. It could also be referring to the heart, too. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? What's that talking about? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. I think there's two possibilities. One, it's talking about the rebellion in heaven, according to traditional Christian theology, when Lucifer led his revolt, a third of the angels fell. A third of all the angelic hosts fell along with them. So the throwing down the spears and watering heaven with the tears could be once they've been thrown out of heaven, the angelic hosts that remain in heaven throw down their spears. Why? They don't need them anymore. The battle is over. And the tears are tears of sorrow for those that are now lost. Okay? That's one interpretation. Another one is they're throwing down their spears at the retreating demonic forces. Okay. And the tears there could be tears of victory, finally done, finally over, as well as tears of sorrow. That is, they're not killing, since angelic beings cannot be killed, but the defeat of those that they were once, again, to us, use human emotions to describe, or human attributes to describe angelic beings that were once their friends. That's the tears and such. Did he smile his work to see? Who's the he and what's the work? Did God smile to see his work? See, this I think is the illusion of paradise lost. When God smiles at Satan and he allows Satan to rise up. Because that's the beginning of what? That's the beginning of being of all the temptation in the world. All right? Did he smile to see his work? I think there's two time perspectives with that. One of the time perspectives <coughs> is after the angelic rout. After the demonic forces are thrown out of heaven. 
Did he smile? Did God smile then when he saw Satan overthrown? All right. What's the other possible time frame? Did God smile when he was making Satan? Knowing what his work would do. Traditional Christian theology, whether of the Protestant or Catholic variety or Orthodox variety, essentially says before God, the Trinity, you have to imagine the Trinity for this, created anything, knew exactly what was going to happen. Not because the Calvinistic predestination, God made everything happen, but because God, if one accepts the notion of God as God, knew if he created everything that would be. Simple point, God is outside time. If he creates, what happens? That creates time. Being outside time, creating, making time, he sees everything within the time as now. Did he smile when he made thee? That is, knowing everything that was going to happen. Did he who made the lamb make thee? And when you get that juxtaposition, the lamb, the tiger, the tiger, the implication is, the tiger may be a metaphor or a symbol of Satan. He who made Satan make you the tiger, uh, excuse me, the lamb. And what might the lamb therefore be a metaphor or symbol of? Christ. Okay. Traditional Christian theology, Christ isn't made. He becomes man, second person of the Trinity, unmade, uh, begotten, not created. All right. And then you get tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. So how is this experience? Why is this a song? Why is this not a song of innocence? I think it's because of the latter stanzas. What does, what happens in the creation of the tiger, if you read the tiger symbolically as Satan? It leads to the fall. Did he who made Jesus, the Son of God, also make you? Yeah, pretty much is would be the answer. Okay. The one doesn't become man, Christ until it's necessary because of the tiger. Okay, go from there to 997. Is that right? Yeah, 997, Passionate Shepherd to His Love. This is by Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe is a contemporary of Shakespeare. He's born the same year. He dies at a very early age, 39. 39? 29. I think I misspoke in my first class. He dies at 29. Couple things about Marlowe that are interesting. Um, some people assume Marlowe was really the one who wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. They're completely without any kind of basis. Uh, more importantly, he died at 29 because he was killed in a barroom brawl. Why he was killed in the barroom brawl is kind of the more important question. According to the traditional story history, he was. Killed over a barroom debt, a debt he, that was owed by him. Okay, that much is known. He was killed in a bar. It did have something to do with the debt. The other part of that, however, and this is you know the, the quote unquote conspiracy theory kind of group, though there's pretty good reason to think it, is it had something to do with some of his actions earlier in his life. Here's what I mean. We know Marlowe worked as a spy for Queen Elizabeth. Okay. Why is that important? Well, a couple of things. Um, Marlowe was openly gay. Term gay was not used then for that, obviously. Nor was homosexuality. That term was not created until the late 19th century. He was openly a lover of men, put it that way. He was also openly an atheist. Both of those, or either of those, was enough in Marlowe's day to be publicly executed. All right? He never graduated from university, yet he was given a master's degree from Cambridge. So he never attended Cambridge, but he was given a master's degree. 
The master three degree was given at the order of Queen Elizabeth. It's thought that that was payment, essentially, for his spying for her. So his death might may have had something to do with the spy. Marlowe was a playwright, uh, Tragical History of Dr. Faustus, Tamerlane, two of his big plays. Shakespeare's acting company performed Faustus a couple of times. Shakespeare quotes from Marlowe in his sonnets, okay? Um, wrote a lot of poems. This is one of them. This is a pastoral love poem, all right? Pastoral, it's set off in the natural world. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. It rhymed in Marlowe's day. Pleasure prove. The valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. That is, we will prove, we will try, we will attempt all the pleasures that the natural world gives. We will sit upon the rock, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks, by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. Well, the birds tend to sing primarily spring and early summer. So it's a spring summer setting. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all of leaves of myrtle. So her clothing is going to be made out of products of the natural world. He's going to make her a bed of rose petals and posies. A gown made of the finest wool, which from the pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. Belt of straw, ivy buds, coral clasps, amber studs, and if these pleasures may thee move, may inspire you, may cause you to act, come live with me and be my love. So if you want these pleasures, come with me. The shepherd swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. So he emphasizes May. And if these delights my, thy mind may move, then live with me, with me and be my love. If these can move your mind, notice he's not appealing to her heart. He's appealing to her mind, he says. Then come li live with me, and we'll enjoy the natural world in all its glory. Now, I don't have it in front of me, but you've got on your syllabus a reply written to this poem by Sir Walter Raleigh, okay? It was standard practice, happens a lot in the, in the Renaissance. When a poet writes a poem like this, another poet, a friend, will often write a response, okay? Raleigh and Marlowe knew each other obliquely. Mar uh, Raleigh was higher class, he was a knight. He died in the Tower of London for, uh, essentially he was thought he was trying to plot against the monarch. Um, but he writes a response. He's not the only one. John Donne, poet we've already read. We're going to read some more of Donne's poetry. Donne also wrote a response called The Bait. Okay? Both the responses are essentially parodies of Marlowe's poem. What uh, Raleigh does is he takes each stanza and he flips it. You know, So if we're going to sit on the rocks and listen to the birds and watch the swains. Those rocks are gonna be freezing cold and we're not gonna hear pretty birds, we're gonna hear like crows calling. Okay? It's not gonna be a pleasant experience. So read that one um, at your leisure. Go from there to, we've already done dog's death. God's grandeur, page 740. God's grandeur. This is Gerard Manley Hopkins, late 19th century poet. He was a Catholic priest. Okay, this is page 740 in the 11th edition, 929 in the 10th. This is a sonnet, right? We haven't talked about sonnets, so I'm gonna do that for just a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Two primary forms of sonnets. The Petrarchan or Italian sonnet, which is the original form, Petrarch invented the form, okay? In the English or Shakespearean form. They're the same in that they have 14 lines. If it doesn't have 14 lines, it's not a sonnet, okay? 
in the Italian sonnet, the structure of the sonnet is it's divided into two parts, an octave, the first eight lines, and the sestet, the last six lines, okay? Between the octave and the sestet, you have what's called the volta. That is, it's a turn, it's a shift of emphasis, right? Sometimes it occurs literally at the beginning of line nine, sometimes it's in the middle of line nine. We're gonna see a poem where it's going to be in the middle of line nine, all right? Um, you need to know kind of the rhyme pattern because that's what helps you determine whether or not a sonnet is an Italian or an English sonnet. In an Italian sonnet, the first eight lines rhyme, that is the last sound of each of the first eight lines, is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. So line one rhymes with line four, lines two and three have their own rhyme, line five and eight rhyme again with line one, and Six and seven rhyme with B, okay, or in the second line. So, God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Just simple, short, declarative. Charged. What does he mean? When we think about something being charged, how do we talk about it? Like this. If this is fully charged, what does that mean? Anybody? Got a full battery. What's the battery story? Electricity. It's charged like with electricity, with the grandeur of God. So what does that mean? You go up to something that is star charged, like walk on a carpet with um, socks, build up a lot of st static electricity, and go up and touch somebody else on the nose, and you and they are going to get a zap, okay? The world, he's saying, is charged like that. With what? The glory of God. But he doesn't mean if you put your hand down in the dirt, you're going to get zapped. He means the dirt bears the glory of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. That is, this glory, like tent foil, if you do this in the sun, you're going to get bright flashes of light. It gathers to a greatness that is the grandeur of God, like the ooze of oil crushed. And the image is of olives being crushed by bare feet, and the oil seeps up between the toes and such. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Notice, all single syllables, all short. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Then means therefore. Now, right now, wreck his rod, wreck, we don't use that as a verb anymore. We use, if we use it, reckon. Why do men then now not reckon, pay attention to, think about, meditate on, cogitate on God? Obey is the idea. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Genera where have they trod? The earth, the ground. How many generations? Go back to the first. That's what's implied. And all is seared with trade. What's the all? The natural world. Seared. We only use that verb for one, one way today. It means what? If you're cooking, you sear meat, right? That means you do a very, you turn the heat way up, you drop a slab of meat onto a cast iron or a griddle of some kind, and it instantly chars it, right? Everything is charred in that sense. Everything is seared, burned, touched with trade, that is, Everything has become a commodity, something to be bought and sold. Bleared, smeared with toil. What toil? Human work. And where's man's smudge and shares man's smell? The smudge and the smell are from work, 
Body odor produced by hard labor. Okay, smudge, oil of the hands. I was telling my first class when I used to work in libraries with medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, some of them required readers to wear cotton gloves so that you don't get oil from your skin on the leaves of these manuscripts. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Why is the soil bare? What happens if you farm a piece of land over and over and over and over and over and you do it for a dozen years? The land dies, it literally dies. Which is why good husbandry, that is good land practice, says every few years, the idea given in the Old Testament is every seven years, every few years, just let the land lie fallow. Let whatever is there grow and let it grow all season long so that when fall comes, it dies naturally. Early spring, you till all that material back into the ground and what does it do? It revives it, it brings it back to life. Why can feet not feel being shod? They also, so they, they don't feel what? You wear these, you don't feel the unevenness of the ground. You don't feel the difference between dirt and grass. What's the implication? Wordsworth is gonna bring up a similar idea in just a moment. We've lost connection with the natural world. We see the natural world as totally being distinct. What's the proof of that? Whenever there is some kind of natural disaster, hurricane, tornado, earthquake, flood, the media accounts will often talk about our being at war with nature. What does that imply? That we aren't natural. <laughs> that we're somehow distinct from what's out there. You know, Mother Nature's angry, you know, so to speak. And for all this, okay, this is the beginning of line nine. What's the for mean? Despite. And despite all this, nature is never spent. That's the turn. Because the first eight lines imply what have we done to the natural world? It's like we've turned it into the moon. But <laughs> nature is never spent. What does that mean, spent? If you spend your money, what do you do with it? You give it away, right? You no longer have it. If you spend your life, what do you do with it? You give it away, you no longer have it. For this, nature is never spent, it's never depleted. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. That is, maybe we've gotta dig a little deeper. We've gotta dig through the surface level death to get to what? To get to the deep down things. And though the last lights off the Black West went, the last lights off the Black West, that's sunset, that's nighttime. What's happening in the east? A morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Why? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. British usage, British colloquial usage, when someone would die, this is at least up until 50 years ago, that person's death would often be described as they went west. Americans would say, you know, so-and-so passed on. Well, the Brits had an idea of where passing on was. It meant to go west. That's why in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, when the elves leave Middle Earth, they go west. They're going over to where they 
came from, so to speak. Okay? What's the Holy Ghost doing? When the sun rises, it's implied that is the spirit hovering over the earth. Back to Genesis. And the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. Well, why does it hover? Here, it's like a hen on its brood. The brood is here. In other words, everything here hasn't fully hatched yet. We're still in the process of, quote unquote, becoming. Okay? God's grandeur is hidden. It's up to us to see it, is his point. Um, my heart leaps up, 758. I think we'll be able to do these two. If I can find them. My heart leaps up, little short lyric by William Wordsworth. Wordsworth is one of the three main romantic poets. The others are Blake and Coleridge. Um, I used to have Coleridge on the syllabus. We used to read Kubla Khan, but I stopped because there's really no point in it. It's kind of like analyzing Jabberwocky. Um, Coleridge's Kubla Khan was written in an opium-induced haze. He'd taken opium, was having this amazing dream, and Wordsworth showed up. Wordsworth is his best friend. Wordsworth and Coleridge worked together often. Showed up, woke him up from this. He had been writing down this dream that he had. Wordsworth showed up. He entertained Wordsworth, went back to the poem, and the dream was gone. It literally ends in the middle of a sentence. Okay? So the romantics, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake, Keats, Shelley, they're lovers of nature. They write predominantly about nature and about the beauty and glory of little natural things. Squirrels in the branches, you know, running around the holly trees out here, leaves breaking out during the spring, etc. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. So what does he say? I look up, I see a rainbow, and my heart leaps up. I did that when I was a child. I do it now as a man, and I hope I'll be that way when I die, or excuse me, when I grow old, or let me die. What does the or let me die mean? Now. While I can still see wonder in a rainbow, don't let me get to some jaded old fart who says, oh, it's just the refraction of white light into its constituent colors. The child is father of the man. That's the exact reverse of what we tend to think. A man fathers a child. The child fathers a man. How so? The child fathers a woman. How so? Grows out of that child. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. What's piety? Religious devotion. Spiritual devotion. I'm not going to necessarily say, you know, devotion to God. Because with Wordsworth, it's sometimes unclear. Does he worship something? He worships nature. Nature is what brings him in touch with himself, so to speak. Okay? Turn from there to... Where'd it go? The world is too much with us, 780. I know we've only got a couple minutes. Another sonnet. It's an Italian sonnet. The world is too much with us. That is... We spend all of our time doing what? Our day-to-day -day activities. We're too bound up with our issues. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. We lay waste our powers, that is, we use, what is he meant by our powers? We use our strength to do what? To get and to spend. Well, when, what's he implying? When I spend money to buy this, what have I literally spent? What must I do to get the money to buy this? Work. What are you spending when you're working? Time. 
every breath you take is one you will not take at another point. How much time did it take? How, much, how many breaths of my life did it take to have the money to spend $1,200, not this one, $900 on a flipping phone? Not a flip phone, but you get the idea. Little we see in nature that is ours. That is, we don't see that we are connected with it. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. Our hearts, our essence. What's the boon? Could be this, could be that, could be this. It's sordid, it's dirtied. We got it in exchange of what? Life. The sea, this sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. For this, he's talking about the literal sea that he's looking at, in the winds, in the waves, in the moon. He says, for all this, we are out of tune. We are not in harmony with the natural world. Remember in um, Keats' Ode to the West Wind, uh, excuse me, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. He talks about being a harp for the West Wind. Well, words were saying our strings are out of tune. It moves us not. What's the it? The ocean, the flowers, the winds, the trees, all that. They don't influence us. We don't let them turn. Here's the Volta. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. I'd rather believe in the old Greek myths. Why? So might I, because if I did, standing on this pleasant lee, a lee is a promontory looking out over the ocean, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. What does it mean to be forlorn? Hopeless. What might the glimpses be? I might have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Does he mean I would literally see Poseidon rise from the ocean? No. He's talking about a time when people were connected with the natural world so that they did what? When they didn't understand a process of the natural world. Flash of light. Thor is angry. He says, I'd rather believe in that kind of creed, now outworn, than what creed? He's not talking about Christianity or any other religion. He's talking about the creed of simply buying and selling. Simply working to work rather than working to live. I mean, the time frame that he's writing this, this is at the height of the Industrial Revolution. Factories sprouting up everywhere. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, yeah, stop there. Have a good rest of the day. Sorry for keeping you over a minute or so. Wake up.